Hi everyone, it's Vanessa. I'm here today to wrap up all the nonfiction books that I read in the month of May. I think I ended up reading about seven books, so let's get started and I'll tell you what I thought about them. The first nonfiction book that I read in the month of May was Mistranslations, Meeting the Immigrant Parents Who Raised Me by Soap and Deb. This has been a very anticipated book for me ever since I heard I feel like Debulky talked about it on Instagram a long time ago. Soap and Deb was a New York Times politics journalist for the 2016 election and he was mostly tasked with following Donald Trump. So that's kind of how I got to know his work and who he was and he had a very active presence on Twitter as well. And this book is him looking more internally into himself, into his immigrant parents coming over to the United States, raising him here, how difficult it is sometimes for immigrant parents to like fully fit in into this country, and also how that reverberates into how their children feel like they fit in into this country. In this book, he talks a lot about his estrangement from his family. He found periods where he didn't really know even how to talk to them, and therefore it led to time where they were very silent with each other, and then just a few years back, he started getting back in contact with them. I want to read the big quote that kind of encapsulated the book for me and how immigrant immigrant family sometimes view how they have to act in the United States and I felt like this really spoke to like how my dad thinks about his place here as an immigrant and having brought his children, me and my brother here as well. And it says, immigrant families often want to seem a certain way, quote, to give off the impression of stability and status at the expense of their emotional needs, end quote. I feel like that is so much what the immigrant experience is for a lot of parents who brought kids here and like uprooted their whole lives over here. Even when things aren't going well, they always have this facade like everything is going well to show the people back home that things are going well, to show new friends that they've made here in the United States that everything is fine. When a lot of the times what that means is that they are struggling internally and their mental health is suffering because they're not being honest about how their experience, you know, kind of like their expectations versus reality of what it's like to be an immigrant in the United States. It just reminded me a lot of my dad and the way he acts about his experience when I know that it's never been an easy road for him. I know that even if he wants to act like everything is fine. A lot of this book also focused on Soap and Deb's humorous side to him. He does stand-up comedy and he kind of speaks about how he used that as a way to deal with his own emotions about the estrangement from his family and being an immigrant kid in the United States. Sometimes that humor didn't always land with me. I also thought that sometimes the book kind of veered to other places, like he talked a lot about architecture and history of India specifically when he traveled over there. It kind of became a travel memoir in parts and it focused less on the emotional journey during those parts and what I really valued the most about this book is when he was talking about his thoughts and how he was dealing with his emotions. But overall I did quite enjoy this and if you're a memoir reader I totally do recommend it. I gave mistranslations three and a half stars. The next book that I read after that that was Start by Believing, Larry Nassar's Crimes, The Institutions That Enabled Him, and The Brave Women Who Stopped the Monster by John Barr and Dan Murphy. They are ESPN investigative reporters and they looked into the Larry Nassar scandal case and trial from kind of a more macro lens of it. They kind of gave you a bird's eye view of all of the issues and the history. I listened to this on audiobook and I literally devoured the audiobook. I was painting one day and I just listened to the majority of it in one day. I think that I'm always invested in stories like this where you hear kind of all aspects of something. So what made this book really interesting to me is looking at the history of USA Gymnastics and looking at all of the coaches that were there before Larry Nassar started becoming involved with USA Gymnastics and kind of the culture that was formed by those formative people that then kind of allowed Larry Nassar to come in and do as he wished. So it's really the traditions and the culture that's been happening in gymnastics for the past 30 years that have really created the space for something like this to happen. For example, John Getter, who is a coach, and Steve Penny and USA Gymnastics and their whole PR scheme, the ranch, which is where all of these girls used to go to kind of train to go to the Olympics, um, and Larry Nassar was always there, and the University of Michigan, and their very disturbing way of reacting to these women speaking out. To this day, they're not doing a 
good job, honestly, on how they're dealing with it. It also talks a lot about the women who are involved, and particularly the women that started with this snowball effect. Rachel Denholander was one of the first that spoke out, and it kind of went from there. I think overall, what's positive about this book is the organization of all of these issues in a way that still is like narratively compelling, but also it's just kind of like a jumping off point. When I read this, it made me want to read other accounts. When I uh, went to review this on Goodreads, there were a lot of comments about other books to read that are better or, you know, give you a different take on this. So two of the ones that kept being recommended on the Goodreads reviews for this book are The Girls by Abigail Pesta. It's much smaller and I think it probably just focuses more on the girls. While this book really did talk a lot about Larry Nassar and how he rose through the ranks, a lot of people don't like the fact that they are giving the perpetrator an outlet to talk about his history and like his accolades and stuff like that. I still think that that's important to show you how those that history and those accolades and the things that he did kind of let him to snake his way into this organization. But I can understand where people are coming from that they don't really want to hear about Larry Nassar's growing up. So that's why I want to read the girls as well and hopefully that'll give me more from the victims and survivors and also what is a girl worth and this is by Rachel Denholander, the one that I said that was one of the first that came out against Larry Nassar. I'm excited to read this one as well. Overall, I did enjoy this book. As much as you can enjoy a book like this, I ended up giving it four stars. The next book that I read is This Is All I Got by Lauren Sandler. This Is All I Got is an account from a year of a woman's life who's living in New York City. She's a woman of color, she's Latinx, she is very much not supported by her family, and she finds herself pregnant, about to give birth, and is homeless at the time. She joins a program where they allow pregnant women to stay in this building with each other as they go through their pregnancy and then delivery, and then they have to find housing for themselves after the fact. So it looks at when Camilla is giving birth and then kind of the year after that of her trying to get her life back in order and basically navigating the bureaucracy that is the social safety net. What I really enjoyed about this book is that I really felt like I got to know Camilla, her highs and her lows. She is a woman who really perseveres and is self-reliant. She knows how to talk to people who are in the system, she knows how to navigate the system, but it still kind of always rears its ugly head at her and you know, causes her struggles and pains because some things are just not created to actually help people. They're created to be stumbles and, and blocks in the way to get them the help that they need. The thesis of the book basically is saying that there's always a system and a bureaucracy that is going to be against people like Camilla who are actually doing their best and trying to get ahead. I thought it was also really fascinating to see how gentrification has changed in the Brooklyn area and the Park Slope area and that's where the building is where they have all of these pregnant women come and stay. I also really loved how Sandler peppered in other information about homelessness and poverty and what single motherhood is like in America. This book also says a lot about what we believe is a person experiencing homelessness and that's people who are on the side of the street or in homeless camps. What Sandler is really arguing here is that's not really what people who are experiencing homelessness for the majority are. The vast majority of people who are experiencing homelessness are actually people like Camilla, who are single mothers, who are living in their cars, who are living in relatives' homes, who are, you know, couch surfing, who are finding places to stay for the night in a hotel using a voucher from a charity or an organization. And what she's really arguing is for us to like open our eyes and see that there is a whole subsection of people that are not being served by the state when they are suffering and going through issues. I would recommend this to fans of Matthew Desmond's Evicted. It had a lot of that same, the same connotations, but it was only following one person. I also would compare this book to Made by Stephanie Land, but kind of like the thing that you wanted Made to be, or I wanted Made to be, and how both people who are dealing with raising a child by themselves sometimes don't make the best decisions. And I think both Made and This Is All I Got show two people who are dealing with the situation and sometimes not the best choices, but I think that Lauren Sandler was able to get into the brain of Camilla so much better to give us an understanding of what she was thinking, why she made the choices she was making, than 
Stephanie Land was able to do in MADE. And that's just my personal opinion. So definitely would recommend if you're interested in any topics about inequality in America, gentrification in America, poverty in America, single motherhood in America, and dealing with the system and bureaucracy. I ended up giving This Is All I Got four stars. After that, I read a pretty disappointing book, and that is I Miss You When I Blink by Mary Laura Philpott. These are essays from the perspective of a pretty affluent white woman who has been in the publishing world, has worked in bookstores. One thing that I realized and recognized as I was researching this book is why it's blurbed by Ann Patchett, and that's because the author has worked at Ann Patchett's book in Nashville. So this book is a lot about feeling like you don't know where to go from here. She's kind of having a midlife crisis, like quarter life crisis, lives in a pretty nice house in a nice neighborhood, has a wonderful husband, has wonderful kids, but she feels unfulfilled in many ways. And it's about her trying to understand those feelings and then trying to get help. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this book. And if you enjoy this book, yeah, I understand why you enjoy it. What I didn't really care for in this book is how she wrote about her life. I feel like a lot of people have very regular, everyday experiences with their lives, but they write them in a way that you can connect with their struggle and their own mental health issues. And I feel like I didn't connect with the author fully in this book to feel those things for her. Let me read what I wrote. My last sentence in my Goodreads review was, if Reese Witherspoon, who is a nice, self-aware, socially conscious white lady who has kids, volunteers, takes care of others, is a creative, were a book, she would be this book. That's what I mean. It's like the author did nothing wrong in this book and her experience is valid and understandable. It just felt like I didn't need to read this book personally myself. So I would pass on this one. I ended up giving I Miss You When I Blink two stars. The next book that I want to talk about is a graphic memoir graphic novel. I decided to put it in my nonfiction because it is based on a refugee's real life and it's When Stars Are Scattered by Victoria Jameson and Omar Mohammed. Victoria Jameson wrote the very lovely book Roller Girl which I loved so much and in this book Victoria Jameson talks about how she got involved with a volunteer organization and then met Omar Mohammed and started talking about his life story and then decided that you know it'd be great if he was willing and wanting to share a story that she could illustrate it. So this is Omar Mohammed's real life as a refugee. He grew up in Somalia and because of all of the conflicts in his country, he was forced to relocate to a refugee camp. It's basically the many, many years he spent at this camp just with him and his brother. He lost contact with his mother and he didn't know where she was. He had to take care of his brother. His brother has some sensitivity issues, is not very verbal, but it's basically about the refugee experience that he had in this camp and how he got out of it. Um, it talks a lot about winning like the refugee lottery and then being placed in a different country and being sent through the United Nations to a different country. I really wish that we had gotten a little bit more towards the end about his experience in the United States. It was mostly like he got on a plane and then the book ended and I wish we had gotten a little bit more information about that. It is interesting to see how he met his wife and how his brother is doing now as well over here in the United States. And this is definitely a graphic novel that I would recommend to children, to adults, to anybody who is interested in refugee stories. I actually listened to it on audiobook and it's really wonderful on audiobook. There's like background noise and um, just like great sound mixing. So I was listening to it as I was reading it on my tablet. Um, I would definitely recommend it, consuming it that way if you're interested in this. I ended up giving When Stars Are Scattered three and a half stars. The next book that I read, there's only two left, the next book that I read is one that was so surprising to me. It's called Why Fish Don't Exist, A Story of Lost Love and the Hidden Order of Life. This is by Lulu Miller who is a science writer for NPR. I listened to this on audiobook. Lulu Miller narrates it and I thought she did a wonderful job. This book is primarily a biography about David Starr Jordan, who was a scientist that was really focused on classifying lots of new species that they were discovering. Discovering, by the way. So he is credited with discovering nearly a fifth of the fish known to humans in his day. He was also the founding president of Stanford University and he was a proponent of eugenics. This book is about David Starr Jordan, but like I said, it uses that metaphor of trying to classify life and trying to keep order in your brain, categorize things and ideas. And so Lulu Miller really takes that to show you the chaos in her own life. So it's also a mix of memoir, which made this book kind of weird, but really satisfying how she made those connections truly. 
I thought that Lulu Miller was a very, very charming writer. She's very humorous. She has this vulnerability about her writing and a finesse to her writing that makes it feel effortless in how she's describing the biography aspects of this book, but also how she's describing her own life as she's dealing with talking about how her father raised her, but also talking about the romantic partners that she's had in her life, how her identity has really changed over the years and she's kind of given up trying to keep things how they are supposed to be and is just now living life as she feels it is she is meant to authentically live that life. Definitely would recommend it on audiobook. I ended up giving Why Fish Don't Exist four stars. Last but not least, let's talk about Yellow Bird, Oil Murder and a Woman's Search for Justice in Indian Country. This is a book by Sierra Crane Murdoch. It is following the life of Lisa Yellowbird, who grew up in North Dakota. Lisa Yellowbird was in prison for a few years and in the time that she was in prison in the late 2000s was when an oil boom happened in North Dakota and on her reservation and in the area that her reservation is close to. But that meant that a lot of outsiders came into the area and it changed just the the way that her community looked and felt. There were just truckers all the time, there was lots of fracking which meant a lot of corporations who do not care about the environment and were doing things to the land that was damaging it. They came in with all of these corporate interests and started making deals with the people who were in charge of the reservation. So all of the tribal leaders there started cutting deals with all of these corporations coming in. They signed a lot of very bad contracts as a result of it too. This book is about that, but it really tries to grab you by focusing on a murder that happened to one of these truckers, workers who came in to frack the land, and his name was Casey Clark. This young man started making connections with other companies and was kind of threatening to leave the company he was with to go work for another company and then bring like all the business with him to this next company, and that caused a lot of friction with the company that he was with prior. He disappeared and nobody could find him, and Lisa Yellowbird was very focused on trying to find Casey where he was or to find his body. This book is really about the author trying to understand why Lisa Yellowbird is so interested in this young man, and the author really shows this as a way for Lisa Yellowbird to redeem herself. Lisa Yellowbird feels like she's doing this to atone for all of the things that she's done to her own kids that led her to prison, thinking about all of the trauma that she has faced throughout her life that had led her to this point. There's a lot going on in this book, as you can tell from like the way that I described it. There's so much. It's like true crime, it's memoir, and under understanding a woman's life. It's like corporate and capitalist greed on a reservation. I think that the audiobook really helped me finish this book. I don't know if I was reading it, if I would have read it all the way through. It's a pretty long book and it did feel like sometimes it could have been edited more tightly. It could have dropped 50 to 100 pages of some of the things that just kept being repeated. I really enjoyed following Yellowbird and seeing how she finds solace and purpose in investigating all of these disappearances and what actually happened. She's actually a very cunning investigator who is doing things like police wouldn't do, but that gets her the answers. I would recommend this book if you're curious about tribal politics. There's a lot of that discussed in this into who gets to be the tribal leader and the kinds of things that they do that might further their own advancement uh, economically, but might damage the people who they're supposed to be serving. I thought that was a fascinating discussion, but also how that really works works with corporate interests and fracking, and again, told through the eyes of a person who has done a lot of wrong in her life, but is now trying to right those wrongs by being of service to others. I think I ended up giving it three and a half stars. And that is it for me and my nonfiction wrap up. Thank you so much for watching my video. If you're interested in any of these books, let me know in the comments, and I'll see you in my next one. Bye bye.